Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program. And thanks so much for joining us. I'm Marcia Eli from the Brooklyn Public Library's Center for Brooklyn History and the Library's Arts and Culture team, BPL Presents. Tonight, it is my privilege to introduce a program that is part presentation, part conversation, and full of nostalgia for a bygone New York. It's prompted by the new book, Kibitz and Nosh, When We All Met at Dubrow's Cafeteria by photographer Marsha Bricker Halperin. If you were lucky enough to frequent one of the Dubrow cafeterias back in the day, tonight will surely bring you memories. And if not, get ready to see a different New York through many wonderful evocative black and white images. Before I hand the program over, I have a few quick notes for all of you. First, you have the option for closed captioning tonight. That button is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Second, we have and will put a link in the chat to the local bookstore in Park Slope, the community bookstore, so that you can explore kibitz and not Nosh on your own, and if you so choose, purchase a copy from an independent business. And finally, and most importantly, I want to invite you all to share your questions for Marcia this evening. Type them into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen throughout the program, and towards the end of the hour, we'll take as many as there are time for. So now it is my pleasure to tell you a bit about Marsha and her conversation partner, Kevin Bacon and Baker, sorry, and uh, <laughs> um, welcome them to join me on camera. Marsha Bricker Halperin is a lifelong Brooklynite. She has photographed the character and landscape of New York City since the 1970s. Her work has been shown in numerous exhibitions, including at the Brooklyn Museum and the International Center of Photography, and Kibitz and Nosh is her debut book. Kevin Baker is a novelist. Hi, Marsha. Welcome. Kevin is a novelist, historian, and journalist. He's written extensively about New York City. His upcoming book, uh, which will be published by Knopf next March, is titled The New York Game baseball and the making of the world's greatest city. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you both so much for being here. It's such a wonderful book, Marsha. Um, every page um, is full of things to take in and details to absorb. And um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm excited to hear your conversation. And again, thank you both so much for being here. Take it away. Thank you, Marcia. Thanks for that nice introduction. I, I'm actually three letters from Kevin Bacon, but uh, it uh, you know it's uh, nice to be here. Thanks everybody for tuning in. A few days ago, our local bagel place, Lenny's Bagels, closed after 23 years at the corner of 98th Street and Broadway. Like so many thriving small businesses in our neighborhood. Lenny's did not fail, but was driven out of existence by an extortionate raise in rent. But even more than the other beloved family-owned enterprises that have been shuttered over the past few decades, our local movie theater, a treasured butcher shop, a cobbler, a laundromat, an appliance store, the closing of Lenny's Bagels has already left a deep wound in the community because it was one of the few places where we could all go. It didn't look like much, and it wasn't very large. In the summer, it wasn't even well cooled. But we loved it because it was someplace where we could go and have a bite and sit and linger and talk with each other. Marsha Bricker Halpern's exquisite new book, Kibitz and Nash, traces the end of another much grander place where we could all go. Dubrow's was the heart of New York's once thriving cafeteria culture, with large restaurants and takeout shops at Eastern Parkway and at Kings Highway and 16th Street in Brooklyn, and in the Garment District in Manhattan. It came into existence in 1929 in a city that was already chock-a-block with cafeterias in one form or another, the Paradise Cafeteria, Bickford's, the Horn and Hard Art Automats. 
but I won't go on since a picture is worth a thousand words and we'll, uh, we'll see Marcia's terrific pictures coming up now. Um, yeah, I just love that um, uh, the feeling when Lenny's is, is no longer there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, this is just, uh, you know, I'm just overjoyed to, to yeah. be in conversation with you uh, my about my work. Yeah. Um, uh, we can look at some pictures and talk about <laughs> that. Please, that would be great. So these are some of the people I met at Blue <laughs> Grouse. <laughs> um, and I know their names. Uh, there's Roz, the ticket lady. There's Mike, who sang songs to me. There's Elaine and Rose and Lieb Lenski, the vaudeville star. Um, so um, this was a place that I um, hung out at for a number of years and got to know people. So um, let's talk about some of the people. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned that there were um, cafeterias all over New York back in the day. Uh, Bickford's was a great one. Lots and lots of them. Um, hundreds of horn and hard on automats. And they're they were like marquees, like theater marquees, the neon proclaiming out into the street cafeteria. Everybody's welcome. Come on in. It's warm, uh, not very expensive. And... Uh, you know, a welcoming place for people um, like Lenny's. Yeah, they really were. And they were so beautiful as well. You know, just the, ty the typography in the signs here. Mm. Uh, you have another picture in the, you know, of the trays and the menus inside, you know, just even when they were kind of run down, that still remained that kind of just really beautiful look to it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's just a wonderful work, you know. This is uh, the, the typography yeah. of the uh, garden cafeteria on the Lower East Side, where Isaac Bashevisinga yeah. hung out. Yeah. And, and you know, they were they were some were grand, but the paradise was a little down on its heels. It I love the eye. And, yeah. <laughs> I love the eye in paradise. Yeah. Uh, and the name, you know, the names. <laughs> So this is a bit down on its heels, but but this is a good picture to really define what a cafeteria yeah, yeah. was. Um, you yeah. know what was it a deli? Well, right. It was it had yeah. um, it had somebody who carved meats? Maybe it had meats. It had a pastrami sandwich uh, for two dollars and twenty cents back then. Uh, it was a diner. It was um, a luncheonette. It had sandwiches and drinks. It was a cafe, coffee shop, uh, but it was a self-service restaurant. No and way. Is that, yeah. And no is that way. really what distinguished it from being a restaurant or a or a, a diner, say, or something that we think of now? Yeah, I think that that is key. Yeah. That it was a se always self-service, mm -hmm. and uh, you usually got a tray and went down a long counter and picked your food and then paid at the end. Yeah, ah, beautiful. Uh, um. So of course, um, the cafeteria that became my place was yes. the Grouse <laughs> on Kings Highway in Brooklyn. Now yeah. I was a street photographer at first. I, that's what brought me to this corner. I was out there maybe fashioning myself as uh, at Jay, the photographer who photographed on the streets of Paris and, mm -hmm. and photographed in windows. And this, you know, this was also like a theater. The curtains pulled mm -hmm. back on right. Duke Browse and this man. And you got reflections. So I'm a young art student and the reflections are very appealing. And inside the cafeteria, there was mirrors on the other wall. So when it when it reflects back, you get all these layers and levels of things. And then you get, of course, Dubrow's repeating in the proper way because it's in a mirror of the back of this. Yeah, you can see it going all the way back there. That's really beautifully well done. I mean, and you were how old when you were, were taking these, these pictures, you know? Early 20s. So oh, yeah, this is really, 1975. Yeah. 
So you're uh, just kind of starting out and you're already this good, huh? You're already doing <laughs> these, these interesting things. So um, so this is the, the neighborhood for all the Brooklynites yeah. out there is King's Highway, where it's happening, the highway. It was a mm-hmm. thriving shopping street. It <laughs> yeah. was it yeah. was an amazing street with all kinds of stores, high end and um, mom and pop stores and butchers. Mm-hmm. And, and you can see a little bit of the luncheonette that was next door with the, the candy machines and the newspapers right. and everything. Right. So this is a woman who was outside uh, collecting with her pushka, collecting for ch- charity. She was a pioneer woman collecting yeah. for Israel. Yeah, yeah. That hand she's holding, yeah. 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 Um, and so I'm really out in the streets photographing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really terrific. And that's another great use of the reflections there to get the whole street scene and so that- in with the people inside. So the taxi's behind me on the street, the mm-hmm. reflection in the window and that fortuitous moment when she's wearing this fair island sweater and the checkers, you know, and, yeah. and these are other people inside um, mm-hmm. that you can see. Now, my reflection is up in the top left corner. I found mm-hmm. myself, my hand, and, <laughs> and I'm reflected a little yeah. in the mirrors and yeah. everything. And I'm wearing a heavy winter a shearling coat <laughs> okay. and my hands are on this camera and they're starting to freeze because you got to <laughs> manipulate your camera so yes, aperture, yes. folk manual focus all that's happening so this is film photography right right and it's um you know it's what by the way the checkers were these huge cabs you could fit five people in them. They had a jump seat, which must have been the most unsafe thing in the world. Right. But they were great. You could take a whole big party in there. Now, speaking of checkers, this is another type of checker. This is a guy who's vital to the whole cafeteria system. If you if you could explain that. Yeah. So this is Mr. Cornbloom because somebody reached out and said, that's my grandfather, Hyman <laughs> Cornbloom, who, you know, did this job until he was 92. He sat on a stool right. and he handed you the ticket and um, they would come out of the machine and make a little ka sound. But mm. he would monitor them because if you took two, if you were able to slip <laughs> two of them out of there on one ticket, you might get a cup of coffee. And on the other, a whole dinner, yeah. chicken and cheesecake and, and the whole thing, and just forget about that. And also in the restaurant, people are always holding tight to their tickets. You see yes. them in their hand. You don't want to put it down on, the, on your table. And it was very safe in, yeah. in the cafeteria, but you didn't want it to disappear. Was it like Charlie in the MBTA? You couldn't get out of there without your, your ticket or yeah. people would yeah. stop you? Yeah. <laughs> but but the most is 25 cents. Try going yeah. to Katz's now. They, it's, right. Their yeah. sign says $50 minimum if you want <laughs> a ticket. Yeah. yeah. And this was the thing. This is for people who don't know how it worked. You took your ticket, you bought your ticket, and people, whenever you p- picked up something, uh, you know, a piece of cheesecake, a coffee, somebody behind the counter punched it. Right. Um, and so then at the end, right, the cashier totaled up how much you had spent which seems like a crazy primitive method now, but um, really seemed to work for many years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he and he also, Mr. Cornwallum, you said started, he, he finished at 92, but he started at 80, right? Yeah, yeah, he did that, you That's, know. Was, which is amazing, yeah. <laughs> it kept him going, he had a place to be every day. Just a second so I, so I'm year. in yeah. the cafeteria yeah. and um, I could, you know, I get attracted by this, this woman with this huge New York Times and the Times were just like massive back in, you know, the yes. were yes. table back then. And I loved how it was draping over these still lifes on the table, like a Morandi painting of, yeah. of uh, yeah. you know, all these um, bottles and jars and ash, the ubiquitous ash, ashtray. Right. And right. so then, and then there's these little elements, the man in his um, Madras coat and a yeah. piece of, uh, <laughs> Leopard skin yeah, and her yeah. wavy uh, pattern on her dress and that regal face. Just yes. So I asked her to take a picture and she said, sure. You know, that was, oh, yeah. And here's this mosaic. Yeah. Well, and that was the thing you were saying. The people were very welcoming all throughout. Yeah. So you know, right this beginning. woman 
um, you know, I came up to her. She was by the, you know, the water fountain in the back, which mm-hmm. at one point also had seltzer, seltzer, yes, free seltzer yes. from the this. seltzer from the fountains. Wow. <laughs> um, and when I said, "Can I take your picture?" she struck a pose, by the fountain, <laughs> which I mean, she was matching her environment. Yeah, yeah. And these are the murals. The murals are great in this. You know, you focus on the the people in this book and that's great because your faces are just amazing the depictions of them but you also get a feeling for what grand settings these were in the backgrounds you know you have these i mean this these were big places the dubrows 45 by 150 foot spaces with high ceilings and these sort of beautiful art deco designs uh, with the mosaics and the murals, kind of in the that New Deal fashion, I, I always get the feeling this is the part of old New York that leaves the greatest ache, the part that people are most nostalgic for, even if they never saw it firsthand, which is the idea that great things could be built for regular people in their day to day lives. You know, I mean, is that have we lost that idea? Uh, well, you know, um. A, it, he was a Jewish immigrant who wanted to build a, a grand cafeteria for his, you know, and hoped to yeah. pass it on for generations of people and had great pride in it. Uh, yeah. The advertisements used to say cafeteria of refinement, <laughs> which I thought was <laughs> funny certainly, because certainly, yeah. there were all these like guys who went to the racetrack who would hang out there in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this was the over 80 club that, that but, hung out every morning yeah. there. So I had an anchor also, like I can come over to them and they would talk to me and kibitz with me. And, and so I didn't feel, uh, you know, I felt... I didn't feel like estranged in there. I felt yeah. somewhat embedded in the community. So I can sit with them, take pictures of them, turn around, take other pictures, walk around and take pictures. So this yeah. picture was was yeah. um, at night. Some women had yeah. come in and I was walking out at the time. This is just, uh, just before yeah. you get to the, the woman, you know, Roz with the tickets and the door. And these women were sitting there so I could capture um, a photo, you know, of people gathering yeah. at night there. And they have, you look at them, they are kind of dressed up. And, and here you are on the left, the photographer, the artist. So this is a, a question I have for you. So imagine <laughs> this is, you know, 19, the summer of 1977 in New York. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and there I am sitting there in the cafeteria and I asked, uh, I, I had the foresight to ask somebody to take my picture. And apparently yeah. uh, David Stark has told me that I um, I said, take my picture in case I have a book someday. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you know, know yeah, saying. no. Um, but no, it's terrific. And everybody was so open, you were describing it. And they even went and, um, you know, would escort you back to uh, we'll walk you back to your home at night. Yeah. You know, it was kind of a rough time in the city and, you know, a little dangerous and they would I would actually walk you home. It's like, you know, would people be so friendly today in a, in a place you weren't familiar with when you just went in yeah. there? I mean, it's, yeah. is that an openness that was rare then or now? I guess we developed a back and forth trust, you yeah. know, yeah. and on the table is an envelope of the photos that I gave out. So I yeah. became well known um, as someone who okay. gave out eight by 10 <laughs> portraits. Now yeah. these were the ones that I printed in the dark room that weren't quite perfect. Yeah. Uh, this wasn't the days of Photoshop where yeah. you could just, you know, I had a lot of yeah. prints yeah. that weren't very up, up to par. So, so I was invited over to join me for cheesecake. People, you know, <laughs> I'd walk in and I was, I was a bit of a celebrity. It was, <laughs> yeah. which is great. That's so much fun, you know, and these, oh, so these, you, pictures are amazing yeah so you mentioned before like like this was a place that i i was fairly young and learned my craft yeah uh, yeah uh, and so when i look at this portrait this was very challenging she's she's half backlit yeah so i'm learning how to control film and exposure so that i can get that that wonderful light on the pearls yeah. you know and on her and yet retain the background so it was and, very challenging. And learning fast from what it looks like. Um, 
you know, it's uh, it's amazing these pictures. It just you know the contrast is great here. Um, yeah, and there's a this is a server at the at the browse too. So the staff was all my friends, you oh, know, because yeah. I took pictures of all of them, and, yeah. and you know, and he was he was taking you know they would have on the on the floor, uh, and uh, people from all over the world work there. You know, and I think they really liked my photos. They would send them back to their families in other countries. And this was the time, you know, it wasn't like everybody had a camera in their pocket with the with the phone. This was, you know, photography was still something special to a certain degree, you know. So, yeah. So I had an SLR camera, which makes me look semi-professional. You know, people <laughs> would ask me, you know, are you from the newspaper or something? I was a student, you know, yeah. but yeah. everybody came up to me. They knew if they posed for a picture you know so I mean I'm sitting there he came right up to me and said take my picture please because you you've taken other people and <laughs> and so it was um I was happy to yeah so yeah, uh, this is an interesting I just <laughs> took out my journal before yeah, yeah. I glad I I did that so that I could remember the names of these people <laughs> and I wrote about this woman one day yeah. I met a lady with a feathered hat <laughs> who told me her life story about her <laughs> husband who left her and no. she started crying on my shoulder oh really wow is that right She's here so in my journal here. yeah wow and then when i said can i take your picture after this whole drama you know it was like a sailor v moment <laughs> yeah she lit up <laughs> oh, that's great um oh now this interested me because you mentioned in the book you said if somebody had asked you on a date to to do browse at the time, you would not have been very happy. You would not have been very impressed. I, I was all business there. I was yeah. there to photograph. And, right. and so I would socialize. So I'm sitting with these people, you know, young people. I didn't yeah. only sit with old people. I was, <laughs> yeah. I was sitting with these young people. There's a woman my age at the time. Yeah. And, um, and I'm socializing with them, but I'm there to take, you know, I'm there to take pictures. Right. And so it's a kind of in the world and yet subjective, being back and always observing what I can take a picture of next. And you mentioned that your family never went out to eat there. So this was, was it already becoming kind of a place people thought of as old fashioned and not very hip, not very fun? Perhaps. We were, uh, when we went out to eat, um, you know, we were a family of five and we went to a Chinese restaurant. That was the <laughs> treat. And, and if we didn't go out, uh, Delhi, my father brought in Delhi. <laughs> so th those were the only eating out foods. Although my parents, you know, used to talk about their favorite foods here, the meats and things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's kind so, of interesting how much it was sort of a place where you would go for special occasions, but also for, you know, and dress up like this lady here but also a place kind of part of the workaday world where the racetrack, you know, touts would hang out and people would, you know, get something on their way to or from work. That, that's yeah. actually true. I mean, it, right. I mean, Rose was celebrating her birthday there. Ah, okay. So she got all <laughs> you know, the fake hair, the fake fur, the <laughs> earrings, probably dentures, but she's beaming out from all of this. The real, yeah. the real spirit animal is beaming out from all of that. <laughs> she really is. Um, but that that's a great thing that I knit that I never really um you know put together that yeah. that it was it was for for some down and out people a place to hang out for hours with a cup of coffee and yet um for a family to come on a sunday you know as an outing and go to the movies that were in the neighborhood so it became um yeah it served a number of purposes it doesn't you know that kind of combination doesn't really exist today i don't think in uh, at least in new york yeah. And here's the here's the tray line. Yes. So yes, there was food there, although <laughs> not much in my pictures. Um, <laughs> but you can tell the uh, the you know the server behind the counter. You can you can get, tell them exactly how you want your sandwich. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, that's a terrific thing. Um, and here's the server. 
And there she had just punched the ticket for the Balinces and yeah. applesauce. And the sign says, cheese Balinces, 70 cents each or three for $2. <laughs> That's with applesauce. And, and how was the food? Was it good? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> Some people say it was, you know, okay. wonderful. You were um, working. I'm, you know, I'm sure um, I remember their their noodle uh, pudding. Uh, mm -hmm. It was big and and they put a, a cherry sauce on it that was really mm -hmm. sweet. And I, I mean, you know, I would fill you up and I thought that was great, but I yeah. never really ate anything. <laughs> oh, of course you were working. <laughs> exactly. With yeah. time. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So um, a lot of people say it was, a, you know, sometimes they say oh, it was a Jewish cafeteria. Well, yeah. it was a cafeteria for everyone. It had yeah. some Jewish specialties, obviously, matzo balls. Yeah. Um, it had uh, Virginia ham on the menu. It was mm -hmm. no, by no means kosher. Shrimp right. salad right. was one of its, uh, you know, the famous favorites. foods, yeah. favorites. Yeah. Uh, but during Passover, you can go there and have matzo ball soup and matzah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, it kind of uh, had this tinge of being known as a Jewish cafeteria. And I love that she wore her uh, sinkers and floaters dress or matzo ball ah, dress. No kidding. She seems uh, kind of anxious there. Maybe she's just looking for a busboy, but she seems it's a wonderful. You, you catch her in that, that emotion. And you said it, it was a sinkers and what dress? Okay. Sometimes people talk about uh, matzo balls. Either they sink in the soup or they float. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, that's the dress with it. Yeah, it's um, it's a terrific picture. It's funny that yeah, it is definitely there is sort of a Jewish accent to the cafeterias. Was that what do you think that came from? Was that something that remind people of the old kind of tea and coffee places downtown on the Lower East Side or the old country or or what? <laughs> It, it might have. It grew out of, you know, dairy restaurants that were more Jewish. Um, um, I don't know. You know, they were um, hmm. they were in um, they were in all different neighborhoods. There were, you know, Horn and Hot Dog wasn't a particularly uh, right. Jewish style. It was American comfort food. Yeah. And they and were popular with everybody. So there were cafeterias for everyone. And and at Dubrow's there were plenty of plenty of Gentiles too. It was a very mixed. Oh kind of, yeah. Uh, Italian, yeah, it was a, a Jewish, Italian, and Irish neighborhood, and everybody yeah. was there. Was there? Yeah, yeah. And here's so, another server. Uh, so this is says welcome to the original Dubrow's. Ah, okay. So that's a bit of a misnomer. Ah, okay. This is the Dubrow's in the Garment District, and this woman would, would be, she was the, the face of the, the counter when you came in. So you mm -hmm. got your cold food first, so that your oh, hot food okay. didn't get cold. Sure, makes so, sense. So, uh, you know, here she is with the jellos and rice puddings and salads and everything. Okay. So this is in the Garment District. So okay. the original Dubrow's was uh, the one on Eastern Parkway in 1929. And then the King's Highway one in 1939, and then the Garment District one in 1952. And the Garment District one was the last one to close, right? Right. In 1985. Yeah. Right. So right. So yeah. I guess by that time it was not only the original do it was the only do browse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember going to that once and eating there. It was nice, as I recall. So it was good. So it was the hub of the garment district. Yeah. Everyone who worked in the garment district came there. It was jam packed at lunch hour. I could uh -huh. not sit down and photograph in there during uh -huh. lunch hour. There were just every seat was filled, packed with people, uh, cigars all over the place. Uh, it had a retail shop. It served millions of meals in its time. Uh, and it also was opulent. It, a little more futuristic and this is this is it here huh this is the this is the garment district yeah yes this guy looks like yep 
Yeah. Right? What do they look like to you? They look like they're scheming something big, but they're, you know, they're probably going over who to pick in the third race at Aqueduct, but they're, uh, you know, but they look like they're onto some, some kind of big deal. It, <laughs> it could be something about, you know, unions, or it could yeah. be whether, you know, how much fabric do we buy next year? Are they going to be minis or maxis or they're, who knows yeah. what they're talking about? But you made a great point about the, um, oh, and this is another terrific mural here. Is this also in this the, is the garment district? district. Wow, yeah. Look Not at, at lunch hour. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's art for the people, uh, elegance for the people. Um, you know, you uh, made a good point uh, before about, oh gosh, and I'm, I'm losing my thinking on this here, but um, uh, yeah, so I guess we'll just move on here, but uh, so, yeah, these were. Um, yep. So it was this very futuristic mural. Yeah. Um, a really wonderful one with Greek goddesses and this Hollywood, you know, steps yes. <laughs> uh, and yeah, you know, cypress trees and it just an odd, very odd and like the Garden <laughs> of the Delights and, yeah. and these mid-century modern chairs, which now I yes. love their collectibles. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was, um, it was, you know, it was a very, it was a more modern. Uh, yeah. Yeah. kind of a, of a place and mm -hmm. um it started to um i started to work in the CETA artist project in 1978 which sounds like a great thing i know another you know outstanding photographer who was also working in that larry uh Rach you know? and um yeah i mean that sounds like a, i mean could we use that today as sort of it was sort of like a WPA program in the 1970s, it, it was. right? It was. It put artists to work in communities and for community organizations. So it took me into other parts of the city. That's how I discovered this restaurant, the Paradise Cafeteria, which, yeah. as I said, was a little down on its heels. But, yeah. you know, the futuristic city then yes. is behind yeah. and be you know the the metropolitan life building and all the yeah. shapes of the city and it had wonderful light coming into it so in the CETA program uh I didn't have as much time to photograph cafeterias but I did I yes I yeah. went out there and caught the the waning days of the paradise and it closed in those years yeah and uh I photographed uh when I went to uh, photograph in Hell's Kitchen, I would go over to photograph the automat on 57th Street. Um, oh, great. Yeah, which I remember was still around, too. And that was and it reminds me of what I was going to ask you before, too, which was you were saying the garment district one was still thriving when it closed. They were still filled up, but it was just the real estate. You know, they made them they made the owners at the point at that point uh an offer they couldn't refuse right it was just too good an offer to sell the to right. sell the shop right i mean this the land and the the building became and it, it's it was hard work it's a, you know it's a long day dealing with you know work yeah. for a cafeteria <laughs> so uh, yeah. And all that food that you have to prepare. <laughs> yeah. And there were a couple you mentioned, uh, or I guess it was Deborah Dash Moore's essay that she contributed. A couple of great essays in this from, from Deborah Dash Moore and Donald Margulies and a, a wonderful poem from Isidore Century uh, mm -hmm. about uh, Dubrow's. But she mentions how there was a real setback, too, with the family where the founder uh, died suddenly, right in the fifties, and and his uh, son. So George Dubrow was a was a larger than life character, apparently, uh, yeah. who wanted to build the business. He he tried to open a a fountaria, mm -hmm. and he gave out. He said mm -hmm. he was going to give out ten thousand ice cream cones on Eastern Parkway. Right. <laughs> and, uh, there's some wonderful pictures of him that I found in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle and the mm -hmm. Brooklyn Public Library pe librarians were very helpful. Shout out to them. They were really <laughs> helpful in getting, uh, you know, scans of these pictures and, and permission so I could use them. Mm -hmm. And he he hosted parties at the Eastern Party, 
Parkway Dubrows for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Okay, when they won the World Series in '55, um, I think they might have. They might have come there. Yeah, <laughs> it was open in the '50s, okay. and it would be a place that he'd host, you know, parties for them. And apparently, the Dodgers had a band with this big drum that said, you know, and everything, yeah. and they would play at Dubrows. The Dodgers Symphony. Band. Which was uh, yes. yes, that's what they called the symphony, and it was uh, yeah, big drum and a couple guys with horn. You know, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, that's uh, great. Uh, and here's another. This is the kitchen here, right? But another. Well, beautiful, or so another one day or, yeah. in 1978, I show up at Dubrow's, and there's a sign mm -hmm. in the window saying uh, we're yeah. closing. Yeah. And they auctioned off all of the, the, they took all the pots out of the kitchen, mm -hmm. lined them up, 100 feet of pots, you know, of all yeah. sizes yeah. and all kinds of baking things because they made all their own foods there. Yeah. You yeah. Just see how, how it was like uh, um, this huge place, the mural, the telephone booths, yeah. uh, the water fountain we've seen, the count. You can spend hours there, all day there. Yeah, uh, just yeah. hanging out. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's wonderful there. And you mentioned too how you would talk with the people there, and uh, you know, and or, or overhear or take part in discussions of such vital things as uh, Eddie Fisher's career in the 1950s. Uh, the sort of things you never would have talked about in the 70s, as some you know, and uh, as a young person, um, I remember having similar conversations about old Bach boxers when I would drink down at the holiday cocktail lounge on St. Mark's Place around the same period. As we lose places like Dubrow's or the holiday, do we lose a way of passing down generational folk knowledge uh, such as it is in America? Is that, you know, do places did places like this encourage conversation between generations? Um, for me, it was a penny university. I like yeah. my coat. Um, um, they would have taught me how to handicap horses, <laughs> which could be interest. Yeah. But yeah, there was, I mean, there was talk about the news and politics and crime in the city in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, the city was on the edge of bankruptcy. Yes, yeah. Uh, so there was lots of talk about how things were, lots of people reading the daily news and, you know, talking mm. about that. But yeah, they, they would talk to me about the old days, but they wanted to know about me as well. You know, not that I had that much experience. <laughs> is is so, there a way we can build another community sort of place like this again? Is that is that at all possible, do you think? Or uh, what, would, what would a Dubrow today look like? I don't know. Um, there is actually in the garment district, there's a, I, I mm -hmm. think, you would call it a food court. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where the old Zubrows <laughs> used to be. It seems to be doing well for the community. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, work has changed. So yes. um, yeah. maybe more than ever, we need a place that we can go like Dubrows because, um, you know, there's the, the theory of, I'm just going to stop the share so we could talk about this, if that's yes. all right. Yeah, so... Yeah, definitely. So, well, you know, and I, 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 and you were doing these between these were between 1975 and 78 for the most part. Yeah, those years, and then I continued till 1985, as as they were really waning. But um, there's the theory of third places. Home, a sociologist Ray Oldenburg came up with it. Oh, okay. Uh, there's home. There's work, and then there's some place in the community, like your Lenny's Bagels, or. Yes, yeah. um, but now people are working remotely, so you know there's there's really, uh, you know, there's the first place home. Right, right. There's the internet and social media, which is mm -hmm. not a. Not a place. <laughs> yeah, sure. but um, um, it was. It's um. It is. It's something I think now that people um, maybe crave and maybe mm. some form of community space will come up. So just to ask you kind of an inevitable couple final questions and we'll open it up to the audience. 
Um, you know, you've been a successful professional photographer for many years now with work in important museum collections. Why was it that it took you this long to gather all these remarkable photographs into into this book? Was it was it something you were resisting? Um, or... I I was actually <laughs> successful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I was a teacher for, I was in education for 35 years. Oh, okay. Uh, so I taught everything from, I did adjunct college photography, pre-K to high school. And then um, I worked in special ed. And um, I did a lot of photography and video there mm -hmm. as okay. part of my job because that right. was a skill right. I had. But the day after I retired, I hit the ground running, look, you know, scanning my negatives, looking at my archives, gathering all the information I had uh, mm. collected and, and trying to figure out how to put it together for a book. Wow. Yeah. Well, and so that's why yeah. it took. And it probably is. It's, it's just as well <laughs> that it percolated yeah. that many years. Yeah. And uh, so uh what's next what do you uh another book another uh is there yeah you kind of get the bug <laughs> <laughs> you've yeah. got in the bug you got you always have any... <laughs> do you uh do you have a book in mind or uh, i don't know um you know i think a lot i i photographed um a lot in hell's kitchen and there is a bit of of the same it was hell's kitchen in the late 70s which was yeah. also a community mm -hmm. changing in yeah. some ways, yeah. it was waning, you know, uh, from, you know, the, the community it was. It, the real estate was changing there. Uh -huh. uh, now I go back and it's just a completely different place. It doesn't have the same street life. So, you know, I think I'm, I'm going to pull, pull that work together. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a lot of work in Coney Island. Ah, a wonderful, wonderful yes. place. Yes, <laughs> a place we both love, <laughs> yes. a dreamland yes. like your yes. book. Yeah. Uh, and I've started looking at that work and pulling that together. And so oh, we'll see. Terrific. All right. Well, to open it up to a few questions from our, our loyal watchers and listeners here. Um, did you ever photograph people secretly? Or did you ask permission? And were they always aware that they, you were taking their picture? Uh, this is from somebody who says that shyness is something she struggles with as a, or he struggles with as a street photographer. Yeah. Um, so initially, uh, I wanted my pictures to be surreptitious, you know, mm -hmm. those moments, those, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like Cartier-Bresson's decisive moments. I wanted to yeah. catch people, you know, fleet. And I even used a twin lens reflex camera. That's yeah. the big box camera you look down. So people yeah. don't realize you have a camera to your eye. And, um, but that became a little cumbersome for catching, you know, fleeting moments. Uh, so I wanted to take candids, mm -hmm. but as I became known there, <laughs> it, it kind of changed into portraiture yes. more and yeah. more where I worked with the people and I said, you know, where do you want your picture? How do you want to pose? <laughs> we collaborated on a, so, um, the, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so you became well. You, you so you turned your your celebrity into something useful, and they're they're certainly beautiful portraits. Um, you, you know, uh, another question: What did your family think of this project? So, um, I <laughs> mm -hmm. my father actually was the one who took me to Willoughby Camera and and helped me oh. uh, when I picked out my camera. Mm -hmm. And that was, I remember that day. It was really exciting because yes, it was, yeah. was such a, <laughs> especially, you know, it wasn't like a paintbrush or a pencil. I was, you know, an art student using those tools. So yeah. he was, they were supportive in some ways, but I think they were hoping, you know, as long as I became an art teacher, right. it was all all right. Uh, right. And I, I don't think they ever would have said, you know, um, said, uh, Oh, you want to be a street photographer? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's uh, but that's terrific, though. And, and when when did you first know you wanted to take photographs? When did you first get the bug? Just to follow up on that, 
So I was at Brooklyn College, mm -hmm. and um, I think my first class, first of all, you know, developing and printing film was a magical thing. Uh, I liked the process, uh, and I just, I had wonderful teachers there. Um, it was a wonderful art department. Walter Rosenblum was my teacher there, and mm. uh, they were very encouraging, and it just seemed to, it seemed to, once I... I decided, oh, I'm going to, you know, photograph King's Highway, my, you yeah. know, my local street, which was really <laughs> fascinating. Um, I, I said, you know, I got some good feedback. And so I kept going with it. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. Um, with, uh, somebody else asks, uh, I love seeing how different each location looked. Were all cafeterias equally welcoming? Uh, would music play in the cafeterias? Um, so, um, I'll start with, with, um, music, um, no, there are none of them that I, you know, there was the clatter of, of silverware and, trains <laughs> yes. and the din of conversation yeah. that was, uh, Donald Margulies writes about that. And, you know, the, the sound, when you went through the revolving doors, <laughs> the sound difference from the street, you came into this uh -huh. ins insular, uh, mm -hmm. space with just this <laughs> little clatter of, of, of uh, silverware and trays and yeah. bus boxes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but there is a tradition. I um, Over the years while I was teaching, I collected any information I could on cafeterias. I guess mm -hmm. I thought I was going to write the book on cafeterias of the United States. And then nice. I even went to Warsaw, Poland and photographed some. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there were cafeterias in different places in different cities where they would have an orchestra playing at lunchtime or yeah. tea time. Yeah. Uh, so there were very opulent ones in the South and the Midwest. Um, mm -hmm. Each city had different styles. California mm -hmm. had cafeterias had um, elaborate ones. So, um, so there would be music sometimes in those. New York was more... Um, you know, a place to to feed people quickly, and mm -hmm. and there wasn't yeah. the entertainment was just in the decor, and the yes. conversation. Yeah. So, um, and they were um, there were large and small cafeterias, and um, all mm -hmm. over the city at one point. So, what made you decide to concentrate on um, on really, uh, you know, on on New York cafeterias? You decided to. What made you decide to focus that on on the New York ca cafeterias and particularly Dubrow's? Well, the Dubrow's was convenient. Mm -hmm. It was local. It yeah. was mm -hmm. uh, so I would I would like in the morning I would before I went to school and then I was working in a dark room I would stop in there and I'd say okay I'll come in for twenty minutes a half an hour photograph mm -hmm. and then go on yeah. to work. Yeah. And then in late in the afternoon, I tried to come in at different times of day. I wanted to yeah. see the lighting and, and the, the varied patrons at yeah. different times yeah. of day. So um, I, I, you know, it was convenient, the one. And also, um, I knew it was becoming a story about a, a mm. special place. Mm. So yeah, is, is there advice, any advice you have? For those those shy photographers who are not sure of how to approach a, a subject like this, well, uh, to find that place that's comfortable, uh, yeah. you know, if it's with your family or friends or some place in the community, you know, it could have been Lenny's Bagels. We keep coming back to that. Yes, yes. But it's a great <laughs> example of what what we need in life that that anchor in the community. Um, so, you know, to find that place and, you know, explore it. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I used to use the, um, the uh, Roy Stryker, who uh, mm -hmm. was the head of the Farm Security Administration okay. photographers, had a shooting script. Hmm. And, you know, and he'd send photographers like Dorothea Lang, although she she didn't really like the script, apparently, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but into the communities and it and would say things, you know, photograph from above, from below, the people close up, far away, 
uh, yeah. photograph different aspects of it. So when I'm in the cafeteria, I even applied it to the cafeteria, photograph the workers, photograph the patrons, mornings, nights, um, you know, low angles, higher angles, things like that. Interesting. Yeah. And just, you know, that's, so you were going from these things worked out really kind of, you know, with the WPA, uh, you know, 40 years before. So yeah. Yeah, well, it was a good model to follow. Still, model, right A um, couple other quick ones here. Uh, have you ever worked in color photography? Well, you know, now digital color, because yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, and it's you know, it's um, I enjoy working in color, but back then, I I really uh was was exploring black and white photography and i was yeah. enamored of tones and textures and how much information you can get and 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 how the how impactful that could be yeah. uh, and then you know as as i shifted to to color i uh you got to yeah <laughs> i just incorporate those elements <laughs> yeah yeah um interesting um a couple questions about menus menu items somebody wanted to know if they had baked beans at the uh at dubrow's um, so the, the yeah. baked beans i believe was famous at horn and hardard yes yeah and that was their yeah. recipe for baked beans was and it came in a little crock if i remember and they were <laughs> Somebody else wanted to know if um, you if uh, the menus changed, and you mentioned that in this that in kind of a effort to survive and attract more customers, they went to Chinese food and other things. Or they so so um so they had did they had you know chicken chow mein on the menu at <laughs> one point with the filled yeah. fish. Yeah. Um, they kept the the you know the the Jewish staple foods. Right. They right. did. Um, I think when shrimp became, uh, you know, popular sometime in the, there's a whole history mm -hmm. of shrimp in America and when they yes, imported yes. it and, um, and when they started making shrimp salad, that was a late addition to the menu and people went crazy for that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose that probably had a lot to do with better refrigeration. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, help it. Um, so uh, yeah, in general, like somebody else was wondering, was Dubrow's an all night place? Ah, to, uh, so there's an ashtray from, I think the sixties that says never closed. Ah, okay. So, and then a couple of advertisements that say open 24 hours. Mm. But by the, by the time I got there, they they would close, you know, maybe midnight on the weekends. And um, they opened early in the morning, probably around yeah. seven or so for, you know. Uh, yeah. But it was a, a daytime thing. And in the garment district, apparently they were also open very late, maybe till three, four in the morning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was down the block from Danceteria. Oh, okay. So people came there of the original one that was on 37th. So apparently <laughs> people Dance came Ateria. there after, uh, after yeah. the clubs. Yeah. To yeah. Browse. I'm, that's my only regret that I didn't photograph people coming from the clubs. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was the sort of mixed thing. Same thing with the holiday cocktail lounge. You'd have, you know, punk rockers come in, you yeah. know, well, these yeah. old, uh, old guys from Eastern Europe. It was a terrific mix that you had in the, in that New York. Was, uh, um, someone else wondered if the emergence of cafeterias reflected early Jewish immigrant socialism, communal eating. Was it was it that communal? Although a lot of people also seem to be alone as well as being communal. So the, they were alone, but I, I think, I like to think that that's, um, that was uh, an important element of yeah. you know, how they were established mm -hmm. here. Uh, yeah. Bring the people together, feed them hearty food at not very much money. You know? Yes, yeah. Uh, and uh, there was um, a cooperative cafeteria on 14th Street. Right? Yes, yeah, that was. Uh, with right on, right, you know, and they had all the protests there. The socialist protests would okay. be there too, Union Square. 
Uh, oh. So there is there is an element of that, I think, um, mm -hmm. in, in them. By the time, um, and, and maybe you'd get more of that at the Garmin cafeteria, people mm -hmm. talk, who would come there and gather and talk. By the mm -hmm. time you got to, you know, the King's Highway cafeteria, mm -hmm. these, these are more assimilated Jews. Uh, right, these people right. um, a little further from, the, from that original yeah. time. But certainly, I think, yes, initially, it was important. Yeah. 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 Somebody else was asking, and I can answer this one, uh, if the Brooklyn Diner on 57th Street was the old Horn and Hard Arts, it was not. I used yeah. to work in that building when I was first out of college. The Horn and Hard Arts was on the other side of 57th Street and more toward the east. I think it was just off 6th or so. Yeah, but, it's off 6th. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, so it was not uh, where the Brooklyn Diner is, but yeah, that was a, a hardy survivor too. The King's Highway one though kind of went out of business because was it because tastes and food changed or tastes and schmoozing? What was the <laughs> you know, what was the fatal fatal blow? Um you know, I think um it was just it was a hard thing to to keep going. Yeah, it had times when it was very crowded and it had other times when it you could feel, uh, I think I say in the book, the joke was, you know, mind my seat, you know, yeah. an old Jackie <laughs> Mason joke, maybe it was, mind my seat, I'm going to go home and eat, and I'll, I'll be back to school. <laughs> come back to the... <laughs> it was a lot of, of yeah. downtime, I would say. Yes, was, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I can imagine it was a challenging thing to keep going yeah. that's, and that, at that size. And, yeah. and tastes were changing. People yeah. were, you know, bagels were coming in, pizza, uh, ethnic foods, Greek diners. I remember yes. the diner that opened on King's Highway. And and the people who used to say, you know, that were very frugal and wanted to go out to eat and were looking to, to you know, eat reasonably but not have to tip on top of eating. Mm -hmm. Had, were were more comfortable by the by the 60s and 70s and wanted to go to a restaurant and be served i think that yeah. was a big part of it and yeah. carrying your tray was seen as something your grandmother did yes <laughs> when you mentioned in part it was initially to really cut down on labor costs in the depression uh in the you know in one of the essays there but that you know eventually it did become a unionized shop that it really yeah. were you yeah. know, they had the workers there had their own union, which was uh, their own chapter, which was nice. Yeah. Well, you know, some, some, but you know, a yeah. lot of people were working, uh, not oh, yeah, okay. yeah, oh, that were there, but um, yeah. you know, they had that opportunity, so yeah, All right. yeah, well, it's a beautiful part of kind of a you know, beautiful preservation of a vanished part of New York, and that's one of the great things you can do with pictures so you know it's uh it's great that you uh that you gave it to us and that you write about the that, oh. that new york that's mm -hmm. you know well so thanks i very think much. words yeah. are a very important part of going with pictures it was well, one of the reasons i wanted to put you know have extensive essays and have have a poem in the book yes yeah and they, they work very well as well as well as your own writing on describing this, but uh, I wanted, yeah, yeah. I think it, words and pictures go together. Have you had any any feedback from the families of a lot of the people depicted here? Have they oh, contacted? Oh, I get, you I or? get, yeah, I get emails uh, occasionally. That's my mother on page, you know, Ray on page one twelve. There's <laughs> Grandpa Dave serving yeah. coffee. Uh, I've identified quite a few of the people. Yes, yeah, <laughs> through That's people great. reaching out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's terrific. And I guess you gave them, you know, prints of their their portraits at the time, too, a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, nobody's come to me and say, I have one of your photos from that. <laughs> yeah, yes. I'm waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> it was a while back. Maybe that young couple there. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, well, this was this was excellent. Thanks so much, Marsha. Thank uh, you. Well, give it to Nosh. Where, when we all met at Dubrow's, at fine bookstores or on the internet, everywhere. Thank you.
And I want to thank you both. Um, and I want to thank all of you for your great questions and also your memories. Um, Sonia, in particular, who talked about working there as a counter girl and had a lot of questions and memories. Um, thank you so much to everybody who commented on living nearby and going to Dubrow's and um, stories. Um, I wish we could put all of these, Marsha, in a book. Maybe that's your <laughs> next one. Um, it's a wonderful conversation and a wonderful book. Um, and um, I'm very, I can't think of a better way to spend a very hot July evening <laughs> in Brooklyn. So thank you. Um, thank you both. Thanks everyone for coming. And um, I wish you all um, a very nice night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Ah, all right. <laughs>